Welcome to 10 Career Questions. My name is Kevin Abnell, and I'm the Executive Director of the York County Alliance for Learning. This video is part of a series of interviews where we speak to various professionals working within each of the 16 nationally recognized career clusters. The purpose of this series is to get to know people working within each career cluster and to help promote a better understanding of various career paths. Resources like this video are intended to help promote career awareness and career exploration as students move closer to making important career decisions. Today, we'll be speaking to someone in the arts, audiovisual technology, and communications career cluster. This career cluster is focused on designing, producing, exhibiting, performing, writing, and publishing multimedia content, including visual and performing arts and design, journalism, and entertainment services. Thank you for being here today. Uh, welcome to 10 Career Questions. We'll jump right in with question number one. What is your name and who do you work for? Uh, I am Cal Weary and I work for the Weary Arts Group. I'm CEO uh, and uh, director. Great. So uh, you just said uh, you're, you're the CEO. What, what do you do in your role as, as CEO uh, for, for business like Weary Arts? So, so we're a small business. And honestly, I got to choose my own name. I could have been an, an uh, executive director. I could have been um, a manager. Uh, I chose CEO because what I found was that a number of the folks that I deal with wore that title. When you're creating your own business, I mean, it's your choice to decide who you want to be. I'm the chief executive officer. Um, of a very small arts organization, um, but I, I chose it myself. And, and my job every day is basically kind of playing a uh, middleman, uh, connecting artists with, um, with contracts. Um, we do arts education in a number of schools in uh, York, uh, Lancaster, and Harrisburg. And we also uh, have online, especially during the pandemic, uh, a lot of online uh, contracts also where we deal with uh, students uh, as far as ways California and Taipei. So, um, and we're trying to increase that because that appears to be a trend that will continue. So, um, but I basically connect uh, subcontracted artists teaching in acting classes, dance classes, musical theater. Um, if it's arts, we do it. Um, and then, uh, we also produce musicals and plays. Uh, we produce original pieces. We produce uh, licensed pieces, uh, both for stage and for um, uh, multimedia. Great. Um, I know the, the industry is pretty broad. This career cluster we're talking about is a pretty right. broad reaching uh, career cluster, but uh, could you just give a general description of the industry that, that you work in? So, um, you know, especially for us when it comes to arts education, uh, what we're doing is we're actually, we're, we're, we are a support organization for schools that want to have a distinctively different uh, experience with the arts. So we're enhancing, uh, many schools have theater programs, many schools have uh, music programs. What we end up bringing in normally is we'll bring in a rock band uh, program or a jazz or funk band program that they might not have. Um, we'll bring in a, a, a musical theater program that's different than the thing we normally have in school or dance, which is very often not in schools and all different forms, hip hop, uh, tap, uh, um, uh, jazz and uh, ballet, things that you wouldn't normally see. Um, but then also we are responsible for uh, working with artists to develop their pieces. So if something from scratch, something from scratch, someone wrote something, they want to hear what it sounds like. We put together actors that will read their, their pieces so that it actually has life outside of the uh, piece of paper. And we help them to develop those pieces. And then sometimes it goes to the full point of we help them develop a play or we help them develop a screenplay. Uh -huh. And then on the other end of it, on the multimedia end, sometimes we're actually shooting these things too. So we, we go to our sound stage, uh, we shoot actual video, we may shoot a pilot, we might shoot a three minute um, you know, short film. Um, the, the ability to go from soup to nuts on a project with our organization is endless. So um, anything from um, audio books to um, information, uh, uh, infomercials to full-blown musicals and plays. Uh, we do all of that. 
So it helps to be multi-talented by the sounds of it, because it sounds well, like that sounds like a lot. You know, I think I'm trying to. Th I always try to remember. I think it might have been Henry Ford. It might have been. It was somebody who had plenty of money said this. Uh, they <laughs> they asked him. They asked him uh, about his education. Ah, oh, I'll remember it later. And he said, you know, they, this is you, you're a very accomplished man. Uh, tell us about your education. He said, well, I have two doctorates and I have four master's degrees in this. And he was talking about that. And they're like, well, you have all those. He's like, yeah, the, over there's my doctorate. Over there's my, he's pointing at people. Right. So what I'm getting at is, is that, you know, me having a lot of skills and different things. I know, uh, I know a little bit of everything just enough to get myself in trouble, but I've surrounded <laughs> myself with some wonderful subcontractors who work with Weary Arts Group who are masters of their craft. And that's the, you know, that's the, driving model of our of our organization and um you know people come people go but you know there's always someone who's looking to be connected and our organization does the connecting piece great uh cal how long have you worked uh in the industry and what are some of the past roles or maybe even job titles that you've had wow uh so um, it's interesting when, when you talk about the industry because, you know, there's a lot of different, like you said before, a lot of different hats you can wear. And, and I started off as a performer very young, uh, probably, I could say actively age four, but uh, probably earlier than that. And doing musicals, plays, uh, uh, auditioning for commercials and things such as that and studying the craft. And then there always comes a point uh, for, for many of us where we then, get on the other side. So I started directing, at, even in high school, I uh, started directing pieces and um, kind of like taking over, sometimes not even what I was supposed to, but uh, seeing uh, how something could be done better or, or the way I thought was better at the time. And that's what kind of took me down the path of being a director and um, directing shows. Um, but then, you know, uh, when it came to jobs, my first real, uh, real job in, in theater, I would say, was at uh, a place called York Little Theater, which is called the Belmont Theater now. Right. Um, and I was, I was a camp counselor for a theater camp. And um, it coincided with my other, uh, you know, I, I guess the best way to say it is I worked as a DJ for four to five years in college. And if that, that's, and I started college when I was in 10th grade of high school. So that sounds oh, wow. crazy. So I literally was in 10th grade of high school. I was dual enrolled and I was, uh, and I'm, I'm jumping back and forth because I kind of forgot that. That's really the real place where my first job, it didn't pay me anything, but I would consider it a job because I put a lot of hours in there. Right. But it established uh, creating programming um, for a 15 year old. You know, and um, I did that for five years. So into my actual college career, past my dual enrollment, I was still the DJ. And then I started playing with bands and then I became a touring band guy and uh, toured for 14 and a half years of, of, of the rock band as a lead singer. Um, and in as I was doing those things, I was also working as a camp counselor for theater and then I was working as a side DJ for things. I was doing videography for people on the side. A lot of these different jobs were coming to me so I could pay my rent, basically. Right. But as, a, you know, my, my actual degree uh, in school is in communications with a concentration in radio and TV. Um, and I thought I would be either writing speeches for people, um, working in PR, um, but I never really planned that. I, I kept working with theater the whole time. And then I got a job at William Penn as a, um, an assistant um, to the director of their performing arts program, basically an artist in residence. And my every single day was different. It was amazing. Uh, working for York City Schools, um, every day we came in there with an idea and the idea would change and we would roll with it and, and the kids were learning and 
I went, I expected to be there for two or three years and it ended up being 14 and a half. And by the time all was said and done, I became director of the program. I, I had gone back to school. I had gotten a degree. I had, uh, became director of the program. And um, so, you know, that's, that was my most major job as being to, the William Penn Performing Arts uh, director um, of that program. Then I moved on to New Hope Academy Charter School. And there I ran the entire performing arts program that they had there, the dancers, their actors, their singers, um, musical, uh, music production, video production. Um, the entire program was created by myself and my team. And that was a program that started with 26 kids. And in three years, we had 400 kids in the program. And when I, it's pretty wow. significant because the entire school is a charter school. And it was probably about 400 students at the school when we got there. So we increased the number of students at the school by double in performing arts students. We were right. the main elective at the school. Um, other people will tell the story a different way, I'm sure. But uh, to be honest, there we had kids being bused to the Strand Capital Performing Arts Center where we actually had all of our classes. And every day, 400 kids would come into that wow. school in our last year. And it would shut down the city a little bit and the buses would <laughs> unload all the kids and they'd pour into the Strand. And we had the Strand stretched to its gills uh, every corner of that place had students in it learning. We had a, 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 an awesome tech lab there where the kids were, um, we, we called it uh, harvesting. They would gather and harvest sounds and they would go all over the building, all over the city, and they would gather sounds, banging on a trash can lid, yelling down an alleyway, uh, the sound of a car driving by. That was the gathering part. And then they bring everything back and they would do the harvest. And they were like, this one doesn't sound good. This does sound good. That doesn't. And they'd take that and they'd make music. And then the music from that would be used for, we would do these nights of talent, very much like a night at the Apollo, where the kids would act and dance and sing and all, do original things and license things. But the house music played would be the music from our music production kids who had been out gathering and harvesting music. And they took original sounds and made beats and sounds. So it, like... Uh, that was an amazingly, obviously you can tell how excited I got. That was an exciting yeah, job like for it. me. And when that job ended, I made the decision to retire as a teacher uh, and as administrator and start the Weary Arts Group uh, with people who I had previously worked with. And Weary Arts Group started in 2014. Um, so we're in our sixth year. Uh, it's been kind of like our extended fifth year because of COVID-19, but uh, we're in our sixth year right now, and uh, I would never look back. I, I would have never, ever expected that I would be anything but a high school teacher. Nothing against that, but I never would have expected. Once I got bit by teaching, I, that's all I wanted to do. And I still love performing and still love doing other stuff, but that I, I realized that was my calling at that point. So to have it end and to start a company just was not in the cards, but it obviously happened. Right. Well, yeah. And sometimes, you know, when, when a, a job ends that, that presents that opportunity for now, now it's time to, to do my own thing and be, right. be my own boss, so to speak. Um, right. uh, the, the next question, a, a lot of what you were just talking about, obviously was, was a lot of experiential, we'll call it experiential training, but uh, right. you, you had mentioned getting, getting a degree uh, in, in the midst of it. So what, what kind of formal training or education did you go through to, to, uh, to get some of these jobs? So I attended your college of Pennsylvania, uh, graduate, uh, 19, 1999, I'll say it. <laughs> uh, graduate 1999. I actually, and I'll be honest. And, and I, and I always tell this story that, that, this way, because I want kids to know, I want young, young professionals to know it does not matter. Um, the journey, the journey, you're going to go all different ways, just as long as you finish, as long as you get to the end of it. I, I started taking classes, um, I went to your country day school, graduated from there. I was a nursery to graduation. So from age four to age 17, I went to your country day school. Uh, my 10th grade year, I started talking about this before my 10th grade year, I started going to your college dual enrollment. So I was getting some of my general ed classes out of the way, as well as taking theater classes at the college with other college students. And I was 15. Uh, my junior year, I started going to William Penn Performing Arts Institute and I was triple enrolled. This is important to understand. I was going to your country day school in the morning till about uh, 11, 30, 12 o'clock. Then I'd scarf down some lunch, 
hop in a car or however I would get there. And I'd go over to William Penn and I'd take acting and dance classes and whatever else they had to offer in the afternoons. Then I would leave there and go to your college and take classes there at night uh, in any number of subjects. So I, you know, I learned pretty early on how to, uh, how to not manage and manage my time. Um, but I built, what I definitely did build was a lot of connections with people um, who were working in what I thought I wanted to do, you know? And so um, I ended up going to your college full time once I graduated. And my, at the time, I don't know that I would, I think I was undecided when I first went in. That's another thing. You sometimes you'll go in undecided. If you know what you want to do, trust me, college will show you what else you could possibly do. And uh, there were a lot of options for me. So at the time, this was the 90s, uh, 1992 is when I first went into school uh, as a full-time matriculated college student. And there, I wanted a theater program. I loved theater, and I, but the school didn't have that at the time. I had a great scholarship. I wasn't going to go somewhere else. I stayed in New York. I started playing with the band and doing other stuff that kind of filled in those pieces. And I did theater whenever I could. But PR was a new um, public relations. Public relations was a new um, major at that time. And it oh, wow. looked to okay. be, yeah, it was new at your college. It, it, they didn't have PR before. Before they had mass comm and they had speech communications, but PR was being developed by Dr. Lowell Briggs. Oh, uh, um, yeah, I remember Dr. And, Briggs. Uh, yeah, and uh, he you know, he was one of the first pioneers there, him and uh, uh, Dr. Furio and Dr. Hall. And I, I mean, honestly, I think Furio and, uh, and Briggs are still at the school. Hall just retired maybe a couple of years ago. Um, but these were, these were, and there was a, Dr. Janine Barr was there. Uh, she did a lot of the speech stuff, but that was the closest to the world that I wanted to be a part of that the school had at the time. And so I signed up for PR. Um, I will preface this to say I have used the skills that I learned in my PR degree every single day of my life, but I have never, ever worked for a PR firm, never right. once worked for one. Um, I've worked in, like I said, arts education my entire life and owning my own businesses. Um, but I learned PR there, learned a lot of stuff before they were even using the word branding. We knew what branding was. Um, we learned Bits, of, bits and pieces of marketing and advertising. We learned about the truth of our company. Um, but I, my, my degree uh, and my training really locked in on building relationships with people and telling stories, telling your company's story. And it was very important, especially working with people like Lowell Briggs and also dealing with interpersonal conversation and uh, interactions and really building solid relationships with folks that you want to work with and work for and have work for you. Um, graduated with a, I'm actually looking at my uh, diplomas on the wall right here, a Bachelor of Arts in Communications. Uh, my major was Public Relations. My minor was Speech Communications um, with a concentration in radio and TV, which means I learned how to edit. Now, if there's anybody out there who does video editing, I used to work, this is how old I am, I used to work on a machine called a U-matic drive. A U-matic drive is non is is not. You guys are all used to nonlinear editing with um, using um, uh, Adobe uh, Adobe Premiere or Rush or um, Sony Vegas or uh, iMovie, of course. That's nonlinear editing where you can just grab anything you want and edit. And you're probably going to use something like that to edit this, right? Most likely, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I used, to, I, I used to do what was called linear editing. Linear editing was kind of like, if any of, these, any of you guys remember what VCRs were, these Umatic drives were like these huge VCR tapes. And you would have three decks, an A, a B, and then you would assemble into a third deck. And basically what you did was you had your A roll and your B roll set up in these two decks and you would mark points where you wanted to switch from one to the other. You mark all those points and then you'd send them through to the tape. There was no computer screen in front of me moving things around. All there was was a monitor in front of me where I could watch it was on each one of them. And that's how all TV was done. That's how all broadcast TV was done back then before there was nonlinear editing. I can't even imagine what what it would be like to go back to something like that because I do quite a bit of editing at this point. And I remember 
the first time I used a nonlinear editor, I sat in front of an iMac, an iMac, it's called an iMac DV. It was a great big bubble computer. And I sat there for 13 hours straight editing my first nonlinear video. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is something that would have taken me two weeks. Like a, it was a short so film. A lot of progress there. there. <laughs> it, it, it was, and I just, I was so amazed by it. What I could do with the audio, what I could do with the video. And, and, and I, I say this to preface that at least in my journey, when it comes to what I do, I always found myself looking at the ways things were being done and wanting to try to figure out ways to do them better. And also training people to be that way, which ends up meaning that I will train people who will one day be better than me because I'm training them to look at things and to look at what I do and make it better, which is an awesome experience. I've had that experience. I've had thousands of students and numbers of, uh, many of them are working in the industry and they are working in ways that I never did um, because they had doors open for them that weren't open for me, but I had doors open for me that weren't open for someone else. So it's, it's a, it's a scaffolding, you know, experience, but uh, yeah, my degrees are in public relations, um, speech communications uh, with a radio TV concentration. Obviously, I did the radio thing, and, and uh, I use all of it every day. I really do. Great. So uh, you touched upon this a little bit, but but my next question is: we, we oftentimes talk about soft skills and some of the some of the sort of the character traits that that it takes to be successful. But what are some personality traits or characteristics of successful people in your field, in your opinion? So, you know, being charismatic, believing in your product. Uh, believing in your story. And, and when I say that, if you don't understand what that means, you will figure it out, but we all have a story. And if you believe in the product that you're selling, if you believe in the, in the service that you're offering, it's much easier than when you're doing something that you don't believe in. And, and, and so I guess, I guess what I would say is skills wise is being personable, you know, um, really listening as much as you speak actually listening a lot more than you speak, hopefully, unless your job is to speak, in which right. case then, you know, <laughs> then you do your talking. Then, then have at yeah. at that point. <laughs> but, but I think that if you're looking at, especially at what, what I do, um, a lot of my work goes into consulting with someone first. Whenever anybody wants to have their child take classes with us, or if somebody wants us to do a piece of work with them, I always say, let's sit down and have a consultation first. Because I think sometimes you have multiple, multiple, like, um, multiple streams of information coming in that are telling you what you need to do with your business or what you need to do with your career, or what you need to do with. And I want to sit down with you and figure out what is really your idea and what you want to do past what your parents said, past what your grandparents said, past what your best friend said, past what your colleague from another business said. I, 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 I do consultation. I do know that there are people who do similar things to what we do, who if someone sends, sends them video footage and says, hey, I want this edited together, they'll just edit it together, keep it the specs and send it out. I need to know the person. I think it's invaluable to really talk to clients and really figure out what it is that they want and need. I think in the long run, you end up doing projects for them that they will, they will they're all, uh, excuse me, that they will love and that they will support and that they will think tells their story properly. Um, also, uh, staying up on technology. Um, <laughs> I am a reluctant editor at times um, only because I really enjoy it, but it's like when I get into editing, I'll, I'll, I'll hide away for days, um, depending on the kind of project. And it really does encompass a lot of my life. And I have family and I, you know, I'm supposed to spend time with them too, I guess. So, you know, I, I do know that about myself. But if I get in front of this computer and start going at it, like you can't see what my setup is here, but I have like this computer in front of me that I'm talking to you on, but I have this other huge screen over here. And this is not my regular, this isn't even my Nook setup. This is my in-house little like... If I want to do some editing at home, I have a shop next door to my house where the big setup is with all the sound equipment and all the booths and stuff. And that's, and that's not even the big space. That's just the one next to my house. There's another one in the city where uh, my partners uh, from Assorted Studios have a full soundstage. We can do full bands and productions there. 
um, eight camera setups, uh, projectors bouncing off of white walls to make whatever scenes we want. Um, we don't even have the green screen there because we have projectors that project actual scenes behind, but we can green screen too. Um, and so different levels, I, I guess what I was trying to get at was um, being personable with folks, listening, uh, hearing their story and tailor making things for them, staying up on technology, uh, reading industry mags or, or online to know, like if you're if you're working in AV, you should know what the news cameras that are that are out. Um, short story: I was working on a movie um, called The Speech That Saved America many years ago, and I was playing a character named William Johnson, uh, who most people don't know who William Johnson was, but um, it was one of those those uh, history hiccups. He was a gentleman from Illinois who uh, hung out with President Abraham Lincoln. And I say hung out with him, he worked for their family. But when Abraham Lincoln went to the White House, he took William Johnson with him. And William Johnson was his valet, he cut his hair, he was a security detail. Uh, he listened to him when he did speeches and they, they theorized that he was the first one here to Gettysburg address. But I bring him up because this was a guy who, um, uh, I played the character of William Johnson. And when I was working on that job, um, they were paying me a per diem. You'll figure out what that is. You'll find out what that is it's per day. Uh, they gave me money per day. And then I had a lump sum that they paid me for playing the part. But every night, you know, the way you're supposed to work, it works with your per diem is the per diem is so that you can eat. Well, I didn't eat during the day. I saved all my money up. And then when everyone else was going to sleep, I went out and hung out with the production crew. So the production crew would go out and eat together. All the actors would go back to their, their hotel rooms or they would, you know, if they live close enough by, they go home. I went and hung out with them. And that's when I first heard about a camera called the red camera. Now at this point, the red camera is an old, you know, an older kid. Well, still a great camera. People still use them, but it was, no one even owned one yet. These guys were sitting there talking about how they had their orders in these cameras um, to describe them. The lens packs that came with them cost more than the actual camera housing for the red wow. camera. And so you would buy a red camera for $20,000 like $20, and your lens packaging that came with it would be like 30. But these cameras, uh, Peter Jackson, who uh, directed Lord of the Rings, uh, he was one of the first pioneers to start using these cameras. Now I mention all this because what I, what, to the next piece of this, I would have never known about the cameras if I wasn't going and putting myself in the right place. And that's the next piece of this. Make sure you're in the right place to learn about technology, to learn about advancements and to connect with people who are going to help you uh, when it comes to moving forward in your industry. Always take those opportunities. Do not be lazy and be a go-to person. Learning how to do a little bit of everything, learning how to do some makeup, learning how to, uh, to, to sew, learning how to, um, uh, to do some editing with video, learning how to do some audio editing, dear God, audio editing, and how to place mics properly, how to do three-point lighting, um, how to wrap cables properly. All those little things that when someone sees you take that, that attention to detail, they think, okay, why don't we bring so-and-so along on this one? You never know what can come from that. Um, and if you're straight, you know, uh, talking head, that it's being there and watching how other people do the job and being there and at least taking mental notes and, and always making sure you're in the right place at the right time. Like those are, that's invaluable, that's you great. know, uh, just, I, 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 there's so many other little things, but, but if you do those things, all the other stuff comes along with it. All yeah. the other stuff comes along. It's interesting. We've, as I had mentioned before, we're doing 16 different ones in all different careers. And, and so far, just consistently, everyone has said how important it is that that education doesn't stop. You know, you graduate high school uh, or you, know, you graduate from a training program, you graduate college, whatever your path, whatever it's going to lead you to. It, it just seems like you always have to be ready to, to continue to learn new things in, in some fashion. Right. So that, that's great. Um, going on to the next question, what's the what's the best part about your job? Well, if you can name one. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, I think the best thing I could say is creating something from either nothing or creating something uh, new from something that existed before. So, you know, taking existing pieces and revamping and recharging and making them better uh, or, or making them current 
and also like someone comes with a concept that hasn't been done before and you get to create that you know um many years ago uh, when Phantom of the Opera came out, obviously someone had already done it on Broadway for years, but it wasn't offered to high schools to do the show yet. And a lot of times, a lot of folks shied away from doing the show because there was pyrotechnics, there were all these other things that were done. If you really wanted to do the show justice, you had to do this stuff, uh, or at least something like it. Uh, a gondola that was supposed to float across the stage. And what, as soon as it was available, uh, we were, if not the first, we were one of the first schools in South Central PA to take on doing um, um, a Phantom of the Opera. It was my last show at York High. And I will tell you, the things that were built and created for that show to immerse people into that world, even though they'd walked into a high school auditorium in the South Central PA school, inner city school, we we had a boat that was mechanized and had low-lying fog. We built a low-lying fog machine with an old freezer so that the fog rolled off the front of the stage so you couldn't see the wheels on the bottom. We took an old jazzy, um, you know, uh, assisted uh, driving apparatus and we chopped it down to pieces and built a boat around it. And then, uh, you know, that boat was moving. We had people trying to theorize on how they thought we were making this boat move all around this huge <laughs> stage. And then our, even, even to the point of our chandeliers that were bouncing in the water, you know, we had people behind those and they were, the boat was weaving in and out. They were like, how are they doing this thing? They were looking for ropes and like, no, it's all mechanized. We, we had a, a gate that was a 40 foot wide by 12 foot tall gate that was suspended uh, on our rigging system that literally like was moving up and down. So that when we went down to the grotto area that uh, you really felt like you could hear the water. We shot video in our, in our swimming pool back in those days, William Penn's pool was still there. We shot video in the pool and projected that video onto the gates so that you could see the guy swimming as the gate went up and he went underneath the gate and all that was done. Like that was an amazing, we even dropped the chandelier into the audience. If you watch the original Phantom of the Opera, they swing the chandelier from the back onto the stage. We did it differently. We pulled the chandelier at the top of the show. We pulled the chandelier up to the, up to the sky in front of the people. We removed sections of chairs out of the center where the chandelier sat. And then at the end of act one, we dropped the chandelier into the audience. If you were sitting behind, it looked like we crushed all the people in the front. <laughs> so it, it, there were so many like little things that we got to do with that show. And, and trust me, I have a lot of other stories, of other shows, but that one always sticks in my mind because where other schools that had a lot more money than we did that had a, uh, you know, bigger staffs, they shied away from it, waiting for kind of everybody to kind of do something uh, with it. We jumped into it full force and really, you know, use a lot of innovations and a lot of uh, a lot of tricks and a lot and a, a lot of praying to uh, get through uh, <laughs> doing yeah. a show like this. Well, and, dropping and, a chandelier on people and just a lot yeah. of creativity and dealing with you know right. work, working with the resources at your disposal. I guess so. That's uh, right, right, and 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 that's coming especially in that program where I can remember you know being a student in the program and having very little to work with to where I became a teacher in the program and. I remember walking around the neighborhood, around the city, finding wood in backyards and loading wood up in, onto, a, onto a couch we found and building a show out of that. That's oh, wow. where we started <laughs> to where we went from that to pyrotechnics on a stage with explosions and fire, uh, you know, and trap doors dropping people out. Like, we went from that to that. It's just an amazing, you know, experience. So I, I'd say my first and foremost is creating from scratch and recreating, you know, and making something better. That's great. Well, kind of flipping that around a little bit, what, what would you say is the most challenging part about your job or, or just maybe a challenge with the industry in general? So um, I'm going to apply it to specifically to, to arts education, but then it also applies to the industry at, at large. When they're looking for things to get rid of, and I say they, like there's this magical they, but really it's the people who write the checks. You know, the first thing that, that, that always gets axed is the arts uh, when it comes to school. Well, my business literally being built on bringing extras, you know, um, part of the reason why my business works, my business model works is because it's cheaper to bring us in to do the work that we do then to hire a teacher who then has a pension and all the other pieces. 
generally it's cheaper to have us because we're there for a few months and then we're gone. And there's and, and, and literally we do the job that we do and we're out of there. Now for some schools, we actually are, we are hired as teachers there. And then that's a little bit different, but then you're still getting for one, for the price of basically one or two teachers, you're getting seven or eight expertise driven, you know, individuals who will, there's nothing that we can't figure out how to do with that group. So um, I would say that the biggest negative that I've found is that something that seems to be very important to everyone always seems to be the first thing to get cut or removed. Now, when it comes to the industry, obviously, um, great example, and I'm not saying anything against the way that people are trying to handle dealing with this pandemic, but, you know, Broadway is completely shut down. People have tried to find some ways to, like, still broadcast some previously recorded things and all, but to, it just, it's like, we are so dependent upon human beings being a part of what we do, like g gathering, that it's hard to imagine what will happen in that part of the industry as we move on. As far as, you know, videotaping and, uh, and filming, they've been getting around it at this point. You know, they're doing all the testing they can. They're, you know, uh, making sure that people are safe and clean and all the things and wearing their masks when they're not, you know, and distancing. But that industry goes on. But I think the toughest thing for me is, is the thought pattern that we're fluff and that we're not important. That's, in, that's tough for me because I'm not saying that I feel that we are as important. Well, the word important is hard because if someone's a doctor or a nurse and they're saving lives, then you would imagine they're more important than the actor or the, or the musician or, or the director. But I would venture to say that the reason why we want to live is because of the things that we create. We're the reason why you care to go to the hospital to get yourself fixed because you want to go to that concert or because you want to see that movie or that musical or that play or you want to be in it. And I think that that's, you know, it's important to recognize that all these aspects of life, obviously, if I'm looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, self-actualization comes at the top of the pyramid and, and right at the very bottom is, can I breathe? Yeah. <laughs> can I eat? Am I eating? Yep. <laughs> Do I have shelter? You know, like you know, these things are, are most important. But I, I, but without self actualization, we are base animals, you know. And that self actualization piece is where we come in. We're we're part of, you know, taking a look at the world as it exists and recreating it. And uh, I, I think it saddens me that we oftentimes are looked at very much as like fluff or like we're not important. And the, the very industry that I'm a part of is why we're able to be doing what we're doing right now. And then this will go and become something that will be fruitful and will grow something. And someone will catch a spark. Some nugget that I've spit out will mean something to someone, I hope. And then that will create something else. And that is how we exist as humans. So I, I know I took that to, back to a positive thing, but I, but I guess no, that's, that's okay. Is, you know, really that that's that that would be the thing that bothers me the most is when it when it gets looked down upon, and it's just tough work. It is not easy work. It right. is not. That, that's what that's why I specifically call it a challenge rather than you know what's what's the worst thing about your job it's you know what's right, the most challenging because right. overcoming a challenge is, is certainly that that's a positive yeah, that's we we all have to be doing that so no no that's getting to a positive in that answer is, is certainly yeah. uh, what we're looking well, for and, and on a, and, and an addendum to that just att attached to it you know sometimes like just on the the uh, educational end of it having educated as many students as I have in the arts. Um, and my team has, you have a lot of conversations with parents about where their kids are going to go to school and what they're doing with themselves. Um, and I've had a lot of battles about, well, you know, why would she go and do this in the arts? And why would they do that? Because, you know, they're not going to make any money. They're not going to do this. And I'm like, well, okay, well, I'm, I am definitely an example of how you can still like, be an entrepreneur and work in the arts and definitely make some money and definitely have a fruitful life. I have a wife and three kids, two dogs, you know, cars in a house. And most importantly, I have my sanity and, I, and, I, and I'm doing what I love. I'm doing what I love. And, and I can also say this, um, barring a, a small stint of time in college when I worked uh, in earth space science uh, and with computers, uh, building computers, um, 
at a small study at Walmart in college. The only job I've ever had really is working in the arts. So my, my plan B always was still in the arts. Um, and I, it's kind of funny because I, I definitely did roll to my plan B, which was to teach and to work in education. My plan A was to be on stage and I still do that. So I, I would just say, I just ended up finding my plan B was more, uh, more advantageous to my life and to my heart and my soul. But I, I do think that um, the toughest thing is, is having people believe in the dream and believe in what you want to work on and see it as something viable. Um, that is tough. And in my household, I have three kids and I have one child who is in New York, who is studying musical theater in New York. He's living in the Hilton right now because um, the school rented out a floor of the Hilton. So he's living La Vida Loca, uh, <laughs> living right on 54th Street, right by, uh, right, right down the street from 42nd, right up uh, Times Square. Um, and I have uh, my girl in the middle, she dances, but she also does uh, 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 spoken word poetry and she does debate. And she wants to be, um, you know, she wants to be a business person, but she loves the arts. She'll never stop loving the arts. And my youngest is like my oldest. She's a drummer and a singer and a dancer. And, you know, but they want to run their own businesses that are attached to the arts. So the, the I think the, the big deal is helping people recognize. I think it was, uh, we had someone come to town who said, for every million dollars, the threshold is a million. But for every million dollars spent on the arts in a city, $23 million is yielded for every million spent 23 million comes back. Well, but the point is, is you can't spend a dollar and get $23. You can't spend, you know, uh, uh, you know, $10 and get $230. It's a million. But once that is spent and is perpetuating the arts, it's somewhere around the, the, the numbers of 23 million comes back. Who wouldn't do that? Why would you, if you had a million dollars, why wouldn't you want 23? And why wouldn't you keep doing that, keep doing that and build a community? So I think what, the more that we can change people's minds and and also like open their minds to the fact of how important the arts are um, and, and uh, audiovisual technology, um, music production, video production, um, we're gonna, we have a lot of people who are built for this work. And right now is our time. Right now is our time. We People are getting tired of seeing the world this way, being done this way. They want there to be more variety in what they see on their screen. Virtual reality is a real thing now. It's not just a, a, a TV show. You really can pop some goggles on and, and put some things on your hands and it's getting more and more interactive. And we're gonna be creating movies and TV shows that you're sitting on the couch in the living room for your sitcoms instead of sitting there watching a screen. It's happening, it's coming. And that's why I, I, I definitely do believe that like staying up on the technology and being one of those go-to people is very important. Definitely. Well, you know, you, you kind of just touched on my second to last question here, but uh, normally I, li I like to ask, what's the career outlook looking like in your industry? And do, do you think it's, do you think there's going to be a need or, or a, hire, a hiring surge in the next one to five years? So what are, what are your thoughts specifically on, on that? I, I believe there's going to be some really weird trends. Um, I say weird. It's not really weird. It's it is is attaching itself to a world. Okay, I'll put it this way. There was a time where if you had a device in your hand and you were in a group of people, you were the weird one. Now, if you're in a group of people and you don't have a device in your hand, you're the weird one. And we're not just talking about uh, people who are, you know, 15 and under, we're saying your parents, your grandparents all have their cell phones, all have their video game systems, all have whatever it is that they're connecting to the rest of the world on they have in their hands. So content being created for those devices is being done right now at a fever pitch, and it's going to continue and continue and continue. So jobs for people who can who can code that, who can create games, who can create um, uh, not only not only full blown movies and TV shows, but also the kind of content that you're looking for when you have a quick 
mentality now that says, I want TikTok. I want quick Instagram videos. Uh, people who can produce those things at a high quality level are going to have work and have jobs and it can be monetized because every time one of those things runs, somebody's ad is running. And the one thing that will never change for us is we're always going to, whether we're capitalists or socialists or, or communists or whatever, we're still consumers. We consume. And if you put things in front of us to buy, attached to the arts, I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that's what it is. Uh, I do think there's lots of jobs out there for people who can do editing, lots of jobs out there for people who are going to be in front of the screen. And then there's going to be a whole nother trend too. Um, coders, coding people. Um, actors whose careers would have ended when they didn't look like themselves anymore will now be able to continue to work because of what they can do with CG. Um, actors who would not have gotten jobs but have amazing voices will start being used more and more for all the content that's going to be created for the billions of people who want to hear that voice attached to this body. There's going to be all kinds of awesome stuff like that and also not so awesome for some folks. But I think the point <laughs> is, is there's a lot of work out there. And the requirement for hiring people into uh, school systems at, both at uh, higher learning and at um, elementary and secondary, having more robust IT teams, that is the direction that the world is going way more robust IT teams. If it all doesn't explode, you're going to need to have more than just this one guy sitting in a closet for a school district. They're, the IT team is going to grow to the size, if they haven't already done it, um, to the same size as any other huge entity. I feel like you would have as many people working on IT as you did for your maintenance staff or who you used to have for maintenance staff um, cleaning up a space. Because now all the spaces that need to be cleaned up and watched after and controlled and built and broken down and put together are on the internet. And we need to be able to interact between the internet and bricks and mortar um, uh, education and entertainment. It needs to be both. I don't, I, even with a vaccine, I still feel like what we've been shown is a world, we're, our country right now is experiencing wearing masks and, and all these other precautions. This has been already going on in other countries for years where you get sick, you put a mask on. We, I, I never in my life, if I saw someone wearing a mask or something like that, I would be like, oh my God, what is really, they must have a horrible thing going on with them. Right. You, go to, you go over to any, any Asian countries, as soon as you get sick, as a courtesy to others, you wear a mask so you don't get anyone else sick. That's not a pandemic. That just makes sense. I would have never in my life thought that made sense. It makes sure. sense. Um, so my point being, um, there's a lot of new amazing jobs. That, that, it sounds horrible because like uh, the reason why is because of a horrible pandemic that's killed all these people. And I think it's horrible. However, we're getting closer to each other. We're learning about things faster. And when it comes to the entertainment industry, and not just entertainment, also information industry, someone has to edit it. Someone has to be in front of the camera. Someone has to create the content, you know, and we want more and more and more and more of it. And it's your grandparents, it's your kids, it's their kids, it's the future. Well, speak, speaking of the future, um, our, our final question just kind of wraps everything up is, um, a lot of people that are going to be watching this are, are mostly high school students, I, I would imagine. That's that's sort of the target audience. But right. what, what's the one piece of advice that you would give to a high school student who may be looking to get into this industry? <sighs> it's going to sound weird. Um, maybe not. You, you do. You will do what you do. Okay? That should be a t-shirt. You will do what you do. So if you are a procrastinator right now. You will probably still be a procrastinator when you're 30. If you are really good at puzzles right now, you'll probably still be really good at puzzles when you're 30 or 40 years old. And I'm using some kind of weird things here. My point being is, if you really want to work in this industry, then you need to start working in this industry now. And what is at your fingertips is, there are editing programs that pop right up onto your phone, both for audio and for video. You can shoot an entire movie on your iPhone 
<laughs> an award-winning movie. Look it up. It's been done. All right. Um, there's so much you can learn right now. I've got kids who are in, you know, 10, 11 years old who are shooting feature length movies that I've dealt with, you know, the, or, or shorts and they're, and they're putting them in festivals and winning because they have stories to tell and they're learning already how to do that. Um, I would say watch TV, watch movies, listen to music, um, go to shows if you can, or at very least stream them uh, in our current situation, and make yourself a student for life of the industry. If you can subscribe to a magazine or at least uh, go online and read about technologies that are attached to what you're interested in, do that. Do not wait with the idea that college is going to be this magic place mm -hmm. where you um, everything is opened up to you. There are things that will be, but a lot of the stuff that's opened up to you is stuff that you're not going to even want. And the other piece is, and please don't, I hope this does not uh, come across as a negative, college might not be for you. At this point in time, I would love it if I could say that everybody, it makes sense for them to go to a school of higher learning. I do think education is always for you. Education forever. But I feel that there are other ways to gain education. Um, if college is right for you, though, don't screw it up. Go do it. Um, but, you know, vocational schools, it gets you right into the mix. Um, uh, our kids over at uh, 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 York Tech, my dear Lord, the stuff that they're doing in your tech before they even go out into industry is amazing. Um, and I know it's being done at other schools also. Um, but at the very end, uh, the very the, the point is, is if you're looking at the things that you that really interest you and you're looking at how they're done, figure out how they're done. Last thing I'll, 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 I'll try to say about this as it pertains to me as a person and what I mean by that. Um, I used to love models, like putting models together when I was a kid with the glue and everything. You don't see people do that very often anymore. And I got to a point where I wasn't, I won't say I was good at it. I'll just say I enjoyed doing it because it was all these little pieces that were nothing that then you put together and hopefully it looked like the picture on the box, kind of like people who like to do puzzles. Um, but then what I started doing, I started taking things like my GI Joe guys and my transformers and I started taking them apart and rebuilding them into other characters, gluing them together, screwing them together. I mean, I had these monstrosities just like in toy story. I was that kid. I was that kid. I laughed so hard when I saw that. Yeah, you, were, you, I, were you were Sid. You were Sid. Yes, I was Sid, <laughs> Sid, Sid. And, uh, not as scary as his, but definitely the same idea. <laughs> And I realized later on in life that that really geared who I became as a director, as a CEO, as, as a creator, as a creative. Um, but I was always doing something, always trying to figure out how things worked. And trust me, I took apart toys, but I also took apart a lot of electronics. And I fixed a lot of electronics and I broke a lot of electronics. And I put things back together and pieces would be left over. And keep this in mind, when you take things apart, both metaphorically and literally, there's always the possibility that some things will be left out, some pieces won't go back in. But as long as it still works for you, it's still viable and still important. So when you are looking for what you think is what you want to do, you may find that some pieces of that may drop off to the side. But as long as you bring it back together, you will find that you can have a very fruitful life and you can do some amazing things because as long as it works for you and works for those that you love around you, it's worth it to do it. So the, the kid who wanted to be a prima ballerina uh, spent her life dancing on stage, but only a very small group of people get to do that. But she paid attention to what was going on with the lights. She paid attention to what was going on the stage. That kid now works in TV, in film, and on Broadway, lighting and producing because she understands from the viewpoint of the dancer what to do and how to explain to them what they're doing. And I think that is the most invaluable thing you can do, um, you know, is to really be, you do what you do, pay attention to the industry, um, 
read as much as you can, watch as much as you can. And if you have the opportunity to connect with someone who's doing what you think you want to do, bug them and talk to them and have them tell you the things I'm saying right now. There's plenty of folks who would be willing to tell you. Awesome. Cal, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate uh, you sharing, sharing this information with uh, everyone who's watching this and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, just thank you very much. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Cal. Take care. Have a good day. You too.